an updated system to suit themselves. That's a hard concept for people to grasp. They've been trained to believe things are happening at the moment by happenstance, by crisis coming out of, of nowhere. And here's what we must do. We must solve this problem at the time. Nothing is further from the truth. And when people wake up, they generally go through the same stages as someone who becomes bereaved when you find that democracy never existed in the first place. You go through an anger phase, a depression phase. You'll blame whoever is handy. And th then hopefully you emerge from it and you become active and you want to learn what's really going on and what has been going on. But you'll also eventually come to the realization that you're up against something, a system that's very, very, very old. It's the only truly organized system on the whole planet. It uses sciences that are ancient in population management. It's, it gave us a system of money. Money is a tool that we must believe in to serve them. Karl Marx was quite right. He was one of their boys who was set up to set up the dialectic. And he was quite right when he said uh, that, um, that money is a tool of the, the elites. It's essential that the people who stop bartering are working for themselves and start using money as a means of exchange, which then can be taxed back from them, are becoming slaves. Because under law and legality, for, thousands of, for a thousand years, no one could take anything from you. Money represents your food, your, your, your home, everything. When it's taxed back from you, they're creating a form of slavery. Therefore, it's essential that the workers believe in money. The elite have all the money in the world. They own all the resources in the world. They don't need money, but they need us to believe it's the only thing that we must use. Today, the power of the purse, as they call it at the top, is being used to the maximum to tax almost everything back from the people that they earn. You tie that in with, with um, Charles Galton Darwin in his book, The Next Million Years, where he, he lays out the next few thousand years up to a million years for the elite and all the changes that will happen. The grandson of Charles Darwin who again was related to the Huxleys and many others. And he said, we are in the process, in, in the 1950s he said this, in his own book, we are in the process of creating, um, he says, slavery has always existed in one form or another. There's different ways to have slavery. You can either get a bunch of henchmen, force a tribe into obeying you and being your slaves. That's a lot of force. But you have to feed them, etc. Or, you can, you can allow them to keep so much of their earnings for themselves, to maintain themselves, and take off all the rest to supply the elite and the, and the structure of the system over them. But he says, we are now in the process of creating a more sophisticated form of slavery. In other words, the general public who would drift into the system and it become natural for them would never twig on that they were actually slaves. You tie that in with the institutions that the Huxleys and the Darwins belong to. They're all Institute for International Affairs, which has branches in every country in the world. They set up the United Nations. They said in their own writings from the earliest times to the present, the world they're bringing in is to be a world where everyone who is born or would be allowed to be born would be born to serve the state. That would be their sole function. That's if they had a job for you to fulfill or a need for you but it's a more sophisticated form of slavery. And we're going through it today. These families uh, have been at this for at least, at least centuries, and I think much, much longer. Why is it that the Rothschilds come onto the scene as a revolutionary family? Why is it they suddenly could take over five countries with five sons, create central banks, or take the central banks over that already existed? And why is it that right to the present time they're in the forefront of world politics? Why is that? Why doesn't a generation of the Rothschild 
uh, go off in some other direction or lose interest. You're dealing here with a specific religion, a religion and a cause, a purpose. You, you will only find this kind of fanatical intergenerational devotion to an agenda when there's a, some kind of religion involved in it. When did all these families crop up with the banks? We find that when the Rosicrucian court was created at Queen Elizabeth I's court, and that's open history today, John D., Francis Bacon, uh, Francis Drake, all these boys were a member of the Rosicrucians. It also broke out in France and Germany at the same time, and they even announced their presence by billboards all across Paris. But the members now, as I say in Britain, were, uh, were open in, in the time of Queen Elizabeth I. Uh, their, their idea was to gain, gain gold and money through plunder, and they basically lived off of the Spanish galleons for an awful long time, as the Spanish were taking the gold out of South America. But John Dee and Bacon also were advisors to kings and queens, and they wrote about how to control, guide, mislead, and always fool the populations, and always, too, to get them into warfare, thinking they knew what they were fighting for, but the public were never to know the true ambitions uh, that they had. John Dee coined the term the British Empire. It didn't exist before he said it and wrote it down. He went to the Queen with the idea, and he said, a system should be set up where countries are invaded or taken over by Britain to create a world system which would be based on free trade. Free trade. It says those countries willing to adopt the British system would be given special status and its most favoured nation trading status. The very same terms that are now used in all the charters they draw up for free trade across the planet. Yet we're going back 500 years to find it first used by an advisor to Queen Elizabeth I. So therefore we know there was a world plan underway. We also know that Kipling, for instance, who worked for the British Raj in India, wrote many books uh, and was a very, very high Freemason, um, was sent over to the US where he spoke to the US uh, Senate, uh, equal to equal, and said, we pass the torch on to you. America was then to take over the financial cost of conducting this world at war, basically, to take over a world until into a, a global system. I'm Alan Watt, and I'm a long-term researcher into the geopolitics and the psychopolitics of a world society, basically. The society that is bringing in globalism in our lifetime. In the 1950s, a book came out called The Next Million Years. And that was done by Charles Galton Darwin. Now, the Galtons, again, were another special brunch, bunch that came out to do with eugenics. They started up the IQ tests that are now used across the world for school children to, to try and get uh, the, the average intellect of, of children, classify them in grades, etc. And they, they, they then intermarried with uh, the, the, the Darwins. So, so Charles Galton Darwin was the grandson of Charles Darwin. He was a physicist. Again, too, what we're talking about is what Huxley said. Huxley being the product, the end product of selective breeding to get a, a scientist, then so was Charles Galton Darwin. They were bred along the Platonic lines. Plato talked about it too. And they became the scientific class. Charles Galton Darwin was a, Darwin was a top physicist uh, in Britain, worked on atomic energy, weaponry and so on, but he also was attached to other delegations at the United Nations, had a lot of power, was well known, getting a lot of exposure on political viewpoints and social viewpoints in the media. And he came out with the book in the 50s called The Next Million Years. 
The Next Million Years is an astonishing book because it's an incredible boast of how an elite would literally rule the world for, an, for another million years and how it would be done, not just could be done, but would be done. And, but his biggest cry throughout the whole book was that the media and education all systems would have to work so hard on the general public, even from schooling up, to get the public to go along and allow themselves to be somehow sterilized. He said that the inferiors would outbreed the superiors, and that was his greatest fear. Now, he spoke on behalf of his own establishment, his own group, so they're into eugenics. And you'll find the United States became a great laboratory for eugenical experiment. People don't really realize that. Because when many of the Albigensian descendants, the Cathar descendants, the Bogomel descendants came into the United States under the guise of Christianity, they set up their own particular eugenical experiments. The Mormons were one of them where couples were matched up. One of the greatest experiments that's ever happened in history was the NIDA, the NIDA experiment on NIDA, New York, where the man who set it up was given free reign to match up men and women, not to live forever together, but only to copulate for specific offspring. Uh, Charles Darwin was involved in the experiment. The newsletter that the Nidas set out went to also the Huxleys. H.G. Wells came over at the latter end for visits to it as well. It was one of the greatest eugenical experiments ever carried on under the protection and the guise and, and the rights of protection of Christianity. That's how they got away with it. And the man, Noyes, who was in charge of it, was a high mason. His cousin was Hayes, who became the President of the United States. So big people were backing this experiment in eugenics through the latter part of the 1800s into the 1900s. What did they hope to gain? How can we, how can we bring this into the Council on Foreign Relations and the Royal Institute for International Affairs or the writings of, say, Huxley's or Darwin's even? Well, they believe and they believed by Darwin's time that all of the people who had the right stuff to excel in, in life, to acquire wealth, good intellects, property, and keep a hold of it through generations, had already been born. Therefore, anything that came after, after Darwin was just chance, perhaps, or luck. Therefore, all the elite families were already established. There would be no more elite families. Everyone else married in common because they did not have their wives or their husbands picked for them. They were not mated up for eugenical reasons. They were called commoners. We find the same expression coming out today with the new term for eugenics. They call it bioethics. And the bioethicists are saying that those people, uh, the common people, have junk genes. It's another slander on the public, you see, meaning you have all these weird, erroneous genes because none of you down through the generations were specifically married up for specific reasons. Whereas you go into the line of, or the lineage of Darwin, and the Darwin family and many other families of his time were already only breeding into one other family for generations. And the Darwins, for about five generations that we know of, by records, birth records, and marriage records, only married into the Wedgwood family, the big pottery conglomerates. And when Charles Darwin's first wife died, he married his mother's sister, who was a Wedgwood as well. The problem with this incredibly close inbreeding and I should say, too, the Huxleys were also descended from Darwin, too. You'll find contacts there and their wives. 